Some people say that Rust is an object-oriented language, because you can group data and functionality together. Others say that Rust is not an object-oriented language, because it lacks inheritance and polymorphism. Whatever your verdict on this topic is, structs are absolutely ubiquitous in Rust, and therefore I chose this as the last topic to teach you in this Fundamentals course on Rust Basics. So sit back, grab a cup of tea, and enjoy this last video in our tutorial series. Today's scenario will be the following. We would like to develop a trading card game similar to Magic or Hearthstone or anything like that. And we're starting from the fundamentals. The very basic of a trading card game is that creatures can fight. And when creatures fight, this happens in the following way. The Minotaur that you see here has three attack and the Goblin has two health, meaning that three damage will be dealt to the Goblin's health, but vice versa, the Goblin will retaliate and deal five damage to the Minotaur's health. In this case, this would mean that the Minotaur ends up with three health and lives, while the Goblin has negative one health, which means he's dead. I already started the implementation, as you can see here. Although you might have some objections as to whether this code is really clean or well maintainable. However, it works and we'll use this as a starting point. So we have four variables that are concerned with the Minotaur. It has a name, it has the current health, a maximum health, and it has a damage. Same thing for the Goblin here. In order to get some output for our trading cards, I wrote this function print status, which takes in the name, health, max health, and damage. And if the health is smaller than or equal to zero, obviously the creature is dead. Otherwise, we'll just print name, health, max health, and damage in a nice output. Of course, the core piece of this code is the creatures being able to fight. So what we'll do here is we'll take only the things in that we need, which is creature one's health, creature 1's damage, and the same thing for creature 2. Note here that we're taking in the health as a mutable reference because we need to change it, whereas the damage, because it is copyable and has trivial size, we can copy. Also note that we need to dereference the health here because health is a reference and damage is an actual value. Otherwise, the logic here is quite straightforward. We just subtract the damage of creature 2 from creature 1's health and vice versa. The main code does nothing more but create those two trading cards, which is the Minotaur and the Goblin, print their status, let them fight and announce that they are fighting now, and print their status afterwards as well. When we run this code, this should come at no surprise that from the beginning Minotaur has full 8 health and Goblin has full 2 health. And after the fight, the Minotaur has 3 of 8 health, and the Goblin is dead. However, if we look through the code, we can see multiple steps where things could go wrong. Especially this print status and the fight, where we need to take in 4 parameters, and we need to make sure that we get them always in the right order, and we always need to make sure that we do not mix up Minotaur and the Goblin. For example, we could just by accident have the Minotaur name here, and suddenly everything is wrong. You might already be aware of a concept on how to solve this problem, which is object orientation. Object orientation has been around for decades and is a very popular concept to structure your data and add functionality to it. So let's get started to do this in Rust. In Rust, we use structs as the blueprints for our objects. So I'll just start with a struct, which is called creature. And you could also call this a trading card, whatever. Um, I just think that if you would build a trading card game, you would have other cards that are not creatures, for example, resources or spells. So I'll call this a creature here. And now I'll define all the data that is contained in a creature. Um, note that we're only defining the data here, not the functionality. So of course we have a name and this will be an own string because we want the creature to own its own name. Then we have health, which is an i32. 
we have the max health, which is also an I-32, and we have the damage I-32 as well. You could add a comma after the last attribute, it doesn't really matter. So now we've defined a creature, and we could already create a minotaur and a goblin with this new creature struct now. So let minotaur is equal to a creature, and we'll have curly braces here, and a very similar syntax to when we defined our creature struct. We'll have name colon string from minotaur. Then we'll have our health, which is eight. The max health, which is also eight because we're starting with a fully healthy creature. And the damage is gonna be three. And of course we need to care for the semicolon after the definition. And we need to make it mutable because now we cannot distinguish between the mutability of the individual fields. We just have to say whether this whole creature, this whole instance will be mutable or whether it will be immutable. And because we need to mutate the health, it needs to be mutable. Now let's copy this and generate our goblin. It has only two health, two max health, but it deals five damage. I don't know, maybe it's a pretty mean goblin. Now we could stop here, but of course we would only have solved part of this problem, okay? Instead of having this minotaur name here, we would have to do minotaur dot, because this is the way we access fields, and we could write name here. And then we could go minotaur dot health, and so on. I guess you get the point. Problem is, we can of course still mess things up here, and we still need to care for the correct order. What we saw here in this struct is only half of what makes an object in Rust, which is the data, okay? The other half would be the behavior of this object or the functionality or the methods or whatever you would like to call this. And in order to implement functionality, we write impl creature, and inside here, we can just straightforwardly define some functions. So let's say we want this print status. I just copy it from up here. But now what are the parameters? Well, we need access to this data that is stored in the structs. And the way you do this is by the parameter self. Self is actually a shorthand for self colon uppercase self. And uppercase self always refers to the struct that you are referencing here. So you could as well write creature here, which means we're operating on this exact creature that the method is going to be called. However, you can always fall back to this shorthand notation, because if you have your first parameter and you do not intentionally define a type for it, Rust will assume that the type is self. Of course, you need to specify whether you're dealing with a reference and whether it is mutable or not. So the way you would do this with the long way of writing it is like this, you would take ownership. This is being a reference and this is a mutable reference, just as you would be used to. And if you're doing the shorthand, you just write it directly on the self. So in this case, I want an immutable reference because I just want to output, I want to read the fields and this will do. So all we have to do now is if self.health smaller than equal to zero, we will have self.name here. Now one thing to take note of, while in this function it was totally okay to write the variables right inside the curly braces of the format string, we can no longer do this in our object-oriented way because we cannot access a field in a format string. So we need to use the placeholder semantics here and do it like this. We just do the same thing for our second string here as well. Self.name, self.health, self.maxhealth, and the damage. And now we're already finished with our first associated function, 
or member function, which is implemented for a creature. We can now replace those two very ugly lines of code and just write minotaur dot print status. And that's it. A very neat short expression and you cannot ever get your parameters wrong here. Let's do the same for the goblin, which is also an instance of a creature. And let's copy that over to the post fight status so that we have full functionality again. Let's also fix this print statement here. And only one thing is left to do now, which is implement this fight method on the creature itself. So we'll have fight creature. And this time we need to take a mutable reference to self and we need to take a mutable reference to the other creature. Uh, we'll just do this like this. And the logic stays the same. So we'll have self.health minus equals other.damage and other.health minus equals self.damage. Now you might notice something very peculiar here. When we're looking at the free function that we had before, we had to dereference the health. Why? Because it was a mutable reference. And if you want to change the value of a reference, we need to dereference first. Here we also have a mutable reference to self. However, we don't need to dereference anything. The reason for this is some quality of life that is built into this dot operator where you access fields or implementations. It features automatic referencing and dereferencing, so it will do whatever is required in this place. This makes the syntax even a tiny bit nicer here. So for now, let's get rid of our free functions that we had up there. Let's get rid of our individual variables for the minotaur and the goblin. And calling the fight here is very easy. We'll just say minotaur dot fight creature and we'll provide the goblin. Of course, we need to have a mutable reference to this goblin. And we are now already done. The code looks way, way cleaner. There is no possibility to mix up the name and the health of one creature with the damage of the other creature. And the syntax looks just so much nicer. So in the end, what we get with object orientation, which is structs and impl blocks, is kind of a modularization. And we have encapsulation for our data. That means you can group associated data together with functionality that needs to work on this data. Now our example is pretty much finished. However, there is a bit of functionality that I would like to show you as well. If you come from C++ or Java, you might have noticed that it's not required to have a constructor here, right? We just defined this data. And even without this impl block, we could already define instances of a creature by explicitly setting these field names. However, what if you need to do some extra functionality when you create a new creature? Well, typically Rust developers will call constructor functions new. So we could now generate one of these functions, fn new. And let's say in this case, we want to add the functionality that we know a new creature will always have its health equal to max health. So we don't actually need to provide the same number two times. So in this case, we will just have name a string. We will have our max health, an i32, and damage also an i32. And we want to return a creature. And in this context, we know that we can refer to a creature with self. And we'll just return a creature now, which will have the name name, which will have its health set to max health. The max health will be set to max health as well. And the damage will be set to damage. So this should work already. However, you can see that we'll have to do a lot of boilerplate. So we have a variable that is called name already, and we need to assign it to name, max health to max health, damage to damage. So in Rust, there exists a shorthand notation, which is 
If your variable that you want to assign to a field has exactly the same name as the field has, you don't need to duplicate the name here. It's enough to just write this variable name once. And there you go. The only field with which we cannot do this is, of course, our health, because we have no variable that's called health, and we explicitly want to set this to max health. So in our code, we could now create a second minotaur, and we will call creature colon colon new. Why do we need colon colon here instead of a dot? Well, a dot is only possible if you have a function, an associated function, that takes the self argument, which means it is associated to an object. If you don't have an object yet, of course you cannot take in self as an argument, and then you need to call it like it is in a namespace, which is creature colon colon new. It's the same syntax that we use to create a string with string colon colon from. And now we just need to provide a name. It's also going to be a minotaur. It has its max health at 8 and damage as 3. As a last part of this tutorial, I would like to show you how to base a new instance, in this case a creature, on another instance of the same class. So let's say we want an elite minotaur. This is also going to be a creature. The only thing that I would like to change is that it has a health of 15. So we'll say health 15 and max health is also going to be 15. But all of the rest should be the same as minotaur2. And what I can do here is I write dot dot minotaur2. And this will mean it will automatically take all of the fields that are not explicitly stated here from minotaur2. So in this case to show you that this works let's use elite minotaur here and run our code and we'll see it has 15 out of 15 health then it fights the goblin now it has 10 out of 15 health working as intended however take note of the fact that all of the fields that we'll take from Minotaur 2 are actually moved. This is not a problem for the damage, because the damage has the trait copy and is therefore copyable, but the string is not copyable, meaning that we cannot reuse Minotaur 2 afterwards, because we can no longer access the string. This rounds up all the fundamental skills that, in my opinion, you need to know before diving headfirst into a project. Well, although video tutorials are a really great starting source to learn a new language, I think it's important to not get stuck in tutorial hell, which probably has happened to all of us at one time. In order to counterbalance this, I will upload a few real-world builds to this channel in the future. However, I cannot overstate how important it is that you get your own hands dirty with some of your personal projects. This will help you get more familiar with the language and fill in some of the gaps that you might still have. If you learned something, please leave a like and consider subscribing. And as always, I hope to see you next time at Green Tea Coding.